Now let's consider the case of second degree price discrimination. Now this is a case where a monopolist faces a market knowing what the different types of consumers are out there, but not being able to distinguish them when charging them the price. In particular, let's consider a case where we have two types of demand, uh, demand curves, so we have two types of consumers. We have DA, who are low, type, uh, low demand consumers. This is their demand curve, which is the red demand curve here. And we have DB, which is a high, higher demand curve. And the monopolist would love to do what we did in the last video, where we explained how we could do a two-part pricing to extract all of the consumer surplus. So, for example, monopolist would love to sell QA units to individual uh, with demand curve DA, and then set a price of PA to extract all of the consumer surplus. Monopolist would also love to do the same thing with, uh, with type B consumers, who have this higher demand curve, would love to charge a price of PA, which is A, plus B1, plus B2, for this higher quantity, QB. Now let's ask ourselves, in a setting where the monopolist can't tell these types of individuals apart, what would be the best way to let them sort into these different, uh, different pricing categories? So let's propose this ideal price schedule and see what goes wrong. So the monopolist prices PA for QA, that's targeted at type uh, A demanders, and PB equal to this whole triangle here for QB. Now, if both consumers chose this, both consumers would get surplus of zero. Now, if consumer A chose the package for PB for QB, what would happen is that the consumer A doesn't value it highly enough and would actually get negative surplus because we'd actually have to go out to QB and the demand curve actually goes negative here and so this consumer would actually get negative consumer surplus from that package so individual A wants to pick package A. What about individual B? Does individual B want to pick package B? Well it turns out that if individual B chose package A, that individual would get to consume QA units of the good and would get consumer surplus equal to this green area. Now, the consumer surplus equal to this green area is actually bigger than the price paid for the bundle A, the package A. This, uh, this consumer would actually get positive surplus if uh, individuals of type B bought package the package designed for individuals of type A. This would be uh, what they would do. They would actually get surplus of B1. And so the monopoly can't extract this area B1. So we need to take B1 off the table when we think about uh, the two, uh, the pricing for individuals of type B. So notice that package B has a higher quantity and this higher quantity has additional surplus that these individuals of type B would be willing to forego to get to quantity B. So what you'll see is that although the monopolist can't charge PB, uh, a PB that includes B1, the monopolist can sort of subtract that part out, knowing that starting from a price of the original case here, if they wanted to get the consumers of type B to reveal their type, they could offer QB and then offer a little bit higher price. That higher price will ward off these individuals of type A who get no surplus from that, but it would induce these individuals of type B to reveal their type, say, yes, I am a type B, I am willing to uh, buy the package that has the higher quantity at a little bit higher price, and then what you'll be able to do is you'll be able to separate them out. Once you're able to separate them out, Monopolist knows that they value it up to area B2, and so the optimal pricing, given that we're going to extract all the surplus out of type A consumers, the optimal pricing would be to price at PB equals PA plus B2 for QB. And so that's going to be sort of our starting point. So let's consider a slight relabeling of the intuition that we just described for second degree price discrimination. Now, the monopolist, sort of as a first pass, is able to charge A plus 
A1 plus A2, as I've redrawn this, from the A-type individuals. Then from the B-type individuals, it's going to charge A1 plus A2, but then charge a premium of B1, because that's all the monopolist is able to extract. And then in total, what we'll get is we'll get two A1s, we'll get two A2s, and a B1. A natural question to ask is, can the monopolist do better? Well, let's consider a very specific deviation from this pricing policy and see what happens about what happens to the monopolist revenue. So let's imagine that the monopolist makes the lower package less attractive. In particular, the monopolist offers, instead of QA, offers QA prime. So now the monopolist is offering QA prime and can only extract A1 in surplus from type A individuals. But you know what the benefit of this is, is that now the lower package is less attractive and the monopolist can now charge a bigger premium for the higher package, to the higher type individuals. In particular, the additional surplus that the higher type individuals get above this low package is A2 plus B2 plus B1. And of course, this was just the premium on what the price was for package A. So the monopolist can charge uh, A1 plus that premium. So let's go ahead and add these up and see whether this was a worthwhile deviation. Now what we'll see from this is that now what we get is we get two A1s, we get an A2, we get a B2, and we get a B1. We, we end up getting B2 instead of area A2. Now that is actually the essential trade-off here. And as you can see, when we start from a place like QA um, on this low package, and we start moving to the left here for what quantity we offer in the lower package, we're going to see that this is going to be automatically satisfied because B2 is going to have an actual height to it, and A2 isn't. So you know, this sort of trapezoid is going to be bigger than that triangle. So it's going to be worthwhile to do some of this uh, quantity depreciation on the lower, pra um, on the lower package. Now, how much is going to be optimal is going to be a function of how much or how high the line segment is on the left hand side. Is that at the margin, the cost is going to be how much A2 changes. And that's going to be the height of this triangle. But at the margin, the benefit is going to be the height of the B2 trapezoid. And according to the marginal principle, if we want to do this activity optimally, what we're going to do is we're going to continue doing this until marginal cost equals marginal benefit. That is, until we pick QA such that this height is the same as that height. So to graphically depict the optimal uh, second degree price discrimination uh, quantity choice for the, lower, uh, the low package, here's what it's going to look like. And this is where uh, the line segment here, which is the, co the marginal cost of, uh, of changing the quantity, is the same as the marginal benefit, this line segment here. Now, the intuition here is that the monopolist is going to try to optimally screen the two different types so as to increase profits. Now, in the optimum here, because we've assumed no marginal costs, what we're going to see is that the monopolist will make profits of 2A1 plus A2 plus B1 plus B2. Unavoidable is this information rent, which is, I'll label B0. That is the minimum amount that we need to pay this individual of a high type to reveal that that individual is the high type. But we, that's surplus that the monopolist just simply cannot extract. Now, this surplus is a result of the fact that in second degree price discrimination, monopolist must induce these individuals to reveal their types. But you can see kind of how we can apply the marginal principle and how we can use this to understand sort of a complicated way of setting prices.